We're here with Professor Danny Shaw, uh, professor of Latin American studies at City University of New York and a frequent commentator at Telesor. And we're going to talk about uh, Brazil's elections right now. Danny has a recent article in the Council on Hemispheric Affairs. And the title of the article is Brazil, More Fascism and Neocolonialism or a Path Back to Self-Determination. Uh, Danny, which path will Brazil take and what's your analysis of how it got there? Yeah, and this segue from Haiti to Brazil, I'll uh, segue drawing this very connection that you raised, the 30,000 Brazilian troops who occupied Haiti from 2003 to 2018, one oppressed nation um, occupying another oppressed nation. There's been some good articles and debates and, and back and forth on the left in the United States. People should check out important pieces in Black Alliance for Peace and in the Black Agenda Report in critique of uh, Brazil in this uh, occupation. Um, certainly, there's nothing but truth in those articles. But to frame it as Lula's uh, occupation, I think is a little bit tricky. I mean, Lula was at war with the generals and the right wing and the fascist components, which are very strong uh, in Brazil. Uh, Lula is not the state of Brazil, but this occurred under his uh, democratic mandate. So certainly he should have to answer for it as well as Jilma Rousseff, though I've never heard either of them um, even address this or speak about it uh, uh, publicly. I would like to think that if Lula um, had a real sit down and critically reflected on what this neo-colonial occupation meant of Haiti, he would certainly issue uh, way beyond an apology, he should be issuing uh, reparations to Haiti. And on this point, I just want to say that those very Brazilian troops who occupied Port-au-Prince in Haiti were then brought back to Rocinha in Complexo de Alimão, in the biggest favelas in Rio de Janeiro, to occupy um, the same word that they used in Haiti, the bandits. They came back to occupy the quote-unquote bandits of Rio de Janeiro. There's a great documentary from the 2004 occupation called Kill All of the Bandits. And that slogan is in quotes because beginning with the 1915 and 1934 U.S. military, the Marine occupation of Haiti for 19 years, the reinvasion in 94 and again in 2004, they always describe their enemies as, as, as bandits. So transitioning to, to Brazil, uh, right now Lula is up by uh, seven percentage of points, uh, percentage points just days before the election. It seems way too late at this point for Bolsonaro to um, grab any, any last minute uh, tricks out of his uh, pockets. Bolsonaro seems down and out in, in the last 48 hours. There's been a very high profile incident when, when one of his main supporters, uh, a congressman uh, by the name of uh, Roberto Jefferson. It's very ironic that so many Brazilians <laughs> named Jefferson in Washington after you after two U.S. presidents and slave owners. And in the case of Jeff Thomas Jefferson, a slave uh, trader. That was an interesting point. I, I was asking a lot of questions about that to different friends over in Brazil. But Roberto Jefferson just had this whole uh, shootout with Brazilian federal uh, police. He promised that he would shoot them. And um, this right wing uh, fascist. After the shootout, um, they sent negotiators. They, they treated him with kids' gloves. And all of Brazil is saying, you know, only a rich right-wing oligarch could shoot police officers, throw grenades at them. And then they send negotiators to take this individual into custody in such a, a, a peaceful way. So Bolsonaro's tried to deny that he has any relationship to this uh, fascist. But as we can tell from this picture in this tweet, um, this is one of Bolsonaro's strongest uh, backers. So certainly in terms of public relations, uh, all of the votes in the polls right now are certainly oscillating downwards for Bolsonaro and upwards for Lula. And and you've noted, uh, Professor Danny Shaw, that in, I believe you noted this in your piece, that the ruling class is in, in Brazil is actually divided on Bolsonaro. That includes the generals, the Brazilian deep state. Uh, what accounts for that? Yeah, I think that's very uh, correct. Um, I was reading a few op-eds after October 3rd, um, the Estado de Sao Paulo and other um, 
organs of the elites, their everyday newspapers and news programs. And it feels right now like the true Brazilian ruling class. Like here in the U.S., we can see very clearly the true ruling class is very anti-Trump. The FBI, the intelligence committees, um, Congress, Senate, uh, Twitter, right? Very, yeah. very anti-Trump. To what extent they're pro-Biden, one could have a certain, you know, debate. Well, in Brazil, they're very, very anti-PT. They're very anti-Lula. Um, Estado de Sao Paulo wrote on October 4th that they refused to endorse either Bolsonaro or Lula. They were both equally um, full of corruption and scandals. They were both equal liars. I'm just quoting the Estado de Sao Paulo, kind of like maybe the daily news of, of Sao Paulo, if you will. And, and many of the ruling class uh, organs, they seem more anti-Bolsonaro than pro-Lula. But Bolsonaro made such a mockery out of uh, COVID, uh, over half a million Brazilians uh, dying, the vast majority Afro-Brazilians and indigenous Brazilians and Brazilians from the favelas. Uh, Bolsonaro's economic uh, record has been uh, atrocious. So I think the very uh, mouthpieces of public opinion, which come from the Brazilian oligarchy and, and ruling class, they've done an about face. They attack the PT really beginning in 2011, 2012, and they set in motion Lava Jato. They set in motion this whole car wash uh, operation. They uh, bugged Lula's phone and Jilma's phone and their defense attorneys in a very illegal way. Those judges who oversaw that were given promotions. Um, so certainly politics in Brazil are very uh, complex, but the true pillars of the PT's power, you have the largest trade union in all of South America, the CUT, the CUCI. Then you have the MSET, the movement of the landless, 1.6 million members. So you have these massive social movements, um, which is really the everyday power of the PT. And they've elected many other candidates who are very progressive and anti-imperialist because the elections on October 3rd weren't just for president. There were dozens of governorships and mayorships and senator positions uh, up for re-election as well. And, and, and what kind of Lula da Silva would return to power? Here we have an interesting statement reported widely, including in Reuters, by his running mate, um, Alekman, who is considered very pro-U.S., has been really close to the U.S. embassy. And he says fiscal discipline is non-negotiable if Lula wins. Uh, in other words, uh, well, let's just read from the article. Um, the first point is fis fiscal responsibility, which is non-negotiable. Former Sao Paulo go Governor Alekman wrote on Twitter, although he didn't elaborate, priorities would include an increase in competitiveness, a reduction in production costs, and the recovery of national industry employment and income. So some of that sounds more like privatization, opening up austerity at a time of uh, well, financial difficulties like so many countries are experiencing across the global south. Um, and he's from this, the center-right social democracy party. So what kind of Lula will return to power? Will it be someone who is a champion of the poor and workers or a sort of um, conciliatory figure? I think definitely a conciliatory figure. The fact that he had to choose Geraldo Alcaman as his vice presidential running mate shows to what extent he's had to reconcile different class interests uh, in Brazil. We can personalize it as much as we want and put everything on, on Lula as if it was all up to Lula's own individual consciousness. I think Lula on a personal level is, is, is clearly um, much more anti-imperialist than perhaps some give him credit for. Uh, he's floated the idea of the Sur, of a united South American currency to combat the dollar. Uh, this was the very conversation he had with o Obama um, some 10 years ago, uh, telling Obama that South Americans, oppressed people were very, uh, were sick of the supremacy of the dollar and they needed to have their own currency that was stable 
and then uh, replied, responded to their uh, needs. But Lula doesn't live in this perfect terrain. Uh, he has these generals, he has these uh, television networks at his uh, throat. So he has to play somewhat of a, a fair um, role where he doesn't ruffle too many feathers, step on too many bourgeois toes, or he could be taken out uh, beforehand. So politics becomes this game of reconciliation. And clearly as anti-imperialists and, and leftists, we don't want to hear that here in the imperialist uh, center, but that's the reality on the ground. I think all of South America is watching um, anxiously. Uh, victory for Lula should open up new opportunities for the Latin American left, specifically for the Bolivarian uh, camp. Venezuela's made a comeback in the last uh, year. Things are very difficult right now with the blockade in Cuba in the hurricane that, that, that hit Cuba recently. Um, a victory for Lula hopefully then means a renewed diplomatic and economic relationship with these blockaded uh, countries, which will then inject uh, a new energy, a new uh, enthusiasm to these countries that have, in the case of Cuba since 1959, in the case of Venezuela since 1999, when Hugo Chavez assumed power, but certainly these blockaded nations need all the support that they can get. And Lula's relationship to China, to, to Russia, definitely um, signifies this multilateral uh, dawn that I think has already started for all of humanity. Yeah, you know, I've traveled extensively throughout the region during the time when Bolsonaro was in power. And everywhere I go, Nicaragua, Bolivia, uh, even places like Mexico, what I hear from people who are on the left in those countries is that they don't believe Lula is some great revolutionary figure that he's a lot that he's going to be aligned with the Bolivarian revolution of Venezuela. In fact, I think one of Lula's final speeches in office was a criticism or denunciation of Venezuela's government. But they understand that him coming back into power will provide a buffer against the imperial power projection of the U.S. because of Brazil's strong economy, uh, its geography, the role that it has traditionally played in the region. And so he does present some kind of hope, and we're seeing a, uh, a, a new wave across Latin America towards the left what would be the best outcome here in your view? And how do you think the Biden administration might attempt to sabotage it? Yeah, these are great questions. Certainly it was the Department of Justice that conspired with- The Lula. Obama Department of Justice. Exactly. They conspired on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis to wage this lawfare campaign against Lula against then President Jilma uh, Rousseff, who was, who was uh, taken out of power, who was couped in 2016 and left in Brazil, is still trying to uh, recover. And lawfare is their new golpismo. If in the 1970s they used actual uh, COINTELPRO, the same way they took out the Panthers here and the Young Lords and the American Indian Movement and the Young Patriots, they took out the left of Argentina. They were able to convert one out of three Uruguayan citizens into um, snitches against the left in Uruguay. They waged a dirty war in, in Paraguay. Well, the dirty war nowadays is to malign and vilify these figures like Cristina uh, Kirchner de Fernandez in Argentina. Uh, Rafael Correa still can't go back uh, home to his homeland in Ecuador. He's in exile in, in Brussels. So this is the strategy that they've used. And if Lula were to go too far to the left, if he were to rock the, social, the seat of social democracy too much, they would certainly reignite a new lawfare uh, campaign against him. So I think a Lula victory uh, means a victory for social democracy. Lula's campaign is squarely focused on three meals a day for the 210 million people of Brazil. 75 million of whom uh, have been uh, food insecure. Um, Lula has focused a ton on uh, social programs 
like Fomi Zero, uh, Zero Hunger, in Bolsa Familia. Uh, this would mean that uh, families, the most needy families, would get more food subsidies and gas subsidies and subsidized rent, really the essence of uh, social democracy. So I think what we're looking at on um, Sunday is a showdown between a Brazilian uh, Bernie Sanders and the Brazilian uh, Trump, with the Brazilian Bernie Sanders way in the lead at this point, uh, seven to eight point percentage uh, lead. I think analysts around the world will be very surprised if uh, Lula doesn't win, come out on top with 54 to 56 percent of the vote on uh, on Sunday. Well, uh, we'll we'll be watching closely and uh, maybe we'll have you back afterwards to assess the situation. Professor Danny Shaw, is there anything you want to add before we take off here? Uh, thanks for the um, invite. I mean, Brazil is a massive country. I think here in the U.S., I always uh, kind of quiz my students. We're talking about 210 million people, so certainly smaller than the U.S. in terms of population. But if you uh, forget about Alaska for a second, I mean, Alaska was stolen. All of the United States was stolen. We're all walking on uh, stolen land here. There's no question about that. But if we forget about Alaska for a second, then geographically, Brazil is bigger than the continental uh, United States. We're yeah. talking about 115 million Afro-Brazilians, the second largest African population in the world outside of uh, Nigeria. So there's a lot at stake. And we're talking about somewhere between 33% uh, and 50% of the entire landmass that is uh, South America. We're talking about the Amazon, the very lungs of, of Brazil. So the way that Brazil goes really dictates the tempo, not just of South America, but all of the oppressed countries. So certainly, I think many people in China, Russia, Vietnam, Zimbabwe, and all of the uh, sanctioned countries are rooting for Lula for this and many reasons.